Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to part two of the four-part webinar series called Ask the Land Promoter, where we're delighted to be working with Farmers Weekly. This afternoon, as before, I'm joined by my two colleagues, Dan Hatcher, our Planning Director, and Nick Carr, Operations Director. We hope this afternoon that you're going to uh, learn a lot more about neighborhood planning and um, our experiences uh, of them. Uh, we'll be doing a um, relatively short uh, presentation with um, various um, facts that we hope you find interesting and our various experiences. The uh, resources available to you uh, within the uh, resources hub, there is a neighborhood uh, plan booklet that has been prepared by the team that we think you'll find useful. So please do um, uh, review that. Um, so again, that's available within the uh, resources hub. Prior to starting the presentation, we're going to release our first uh, poll question. Um, and uh, this is, do you know what a neighborhood plan is? Um, you've got three choices, uh, yes, uh, heard of it, or, or no. And we'll be um, releasing the results of those shortly. So if we can have the uh, first slide up, please. Thanks very much. So welcome to Neighbourhood Plans Explained by Roscon Strategic Land. Where we're hoping to explain what a neighbourhood plan is and how it's prepared. We're looking to highlight why it's relevant to landowners looking to promote their land for development to become engaged within the neighborhood plan process. And we're looking to demonstrate how to be effective during the neighborhood plan process so that you can be an active participant. We're looking to share our experience of working with those responsible for preparing neighborhood plans, the steering groups, the key local stakeholders, the local residents and my colleagues will be elaborating in more detail on that and we'll be looking to answer your questions on neighborhood planning. Roscon Strategic Land has got what we regard as a wide breadth of experience within neighborhood planning. We've been involved with a number of landowners and their advisors um, working their land through neighborhood plans, promoting it through, um, uh, and indeed ensuring that uh, their land was the selected parcel uh, to ensure they received a nice land return. We, we have experience within the villages of Honeybourne, Desford, Weedenbeck, Coase Hill, and currently working in Sharnbrook, and there, there are others as well. Um, that um, again, uh, both Dan and Nick may uh, may refer to a little bit later on. I'd like now to hand over to uh, Dan, who's going to continue with the remainder of the uh, next few slides. Thank you, Dan. Could have the next slide. Thank you. So, yes, if I, um, I'll uh, try and explain um, the sort of uh, general overarching um, background to neighbourhood plans first. Um, as you may know, uh, the English planning system is a is a plan led system. Um, so, all local planning authorities across England are required to have a district wide local plan in place uh, to outline future development needs. And all planning applications should therefore normally be in conformity with that local plan. However, in uh, 2011, 
the local localism act was um, introduced and that uh, provided um, local communities with the ability to prepare a plan to cover their local area usually at a parish level and and, was, um, and is known as a neighborhood plan this is to um this should set a shared vision for a local area and help shape future development within it neighborhood plans um normally cover a period of at least 10 years and should include policies to help deliver the vision, guiding new development to help meet local needs and specific objectives. Once the neighborhood plan is formally made or adopted, it has the same legal status as a local plan and all future planning applications in the area must have regard to the policies within it. Neighborhood plans are usually um, prepared by a group referred to as the qualifying body, and this is usually set up by the parish council and will normally include a mix of councillors and residents helping to prepare the neighbourhood plan on a voluntary basis. Ideally, members of the group will have a range of suitable skills necessary to fulfil the variety of tasks required, but external, external help is often called on for more specialist areas of work. The local planning authority is also legally required to support the neighbourhood plan group and, fi and financial support is also available from cent central government to commission specialist consultants or help with the ad administrative costs of preparing the plan itself. Next slide, please. So how, how popular are neighbourhood plans? Well, um, since tw 2011, um, it's probably fair to say it was a bit of a slow start. Uh, take up was initially slow. Um, the first one, first neighbourhood plan was made um, in Eden in Cumbria in 2013. But since this time, uh, there has been a, a gradual rise in take up across across the country. And there, there have now been uh, 956 neighbourhood plans made across England as at uh, April this year. Um, but there are there are almost another thousand currently in preparation um, and for context there are over 9,500 parishes across England so there is still significant scope for more to come forward over time. Indeed the government has recently reconfirmed its commitment to encouraging local areas to prepare neighbourhood plans with associated funding to assist continuing to be available. Finally, on this slide, we've got um, we've identified the top local uh, top ten local authorities with made neighbourhood plans across England. Um, analysis of this uh, demonstrates that the geographical spread shows that neighbourhood plans are particularly popular in the more rural areas of the country, suggesting that neighbour neighbourhood plans could be helping deliver local objectives that, that are not being addressed by local plans such as the protection or improvement of local services and facilities or housing schemes to meet specific local needs. It also suggests that neighbourhood plans appear to be allocating sites for housing to help protect against uh, help protect areas against speculative developments elsewhere within an area. This is because the majority of made neighbourhood plans are in locations outside the green belt that surrounds uh, the major conurbations across the country where speculative housing development is severely restricted and additional protection through a neighborhood plan is therefore unnecessary. Next slide, please. So how is a, a neighborhood plan prepared? So this is a, a, a basic flow chart uh, from one to nine. Um, which explains the, the key stages in a neighbourhood plan's preparation. So the first stage um, is once a local area has decided to prepare a neighbourhood plan, the qualifying body must make an application to the local planning authority for its area to be formally designated. This is normally a straightforward task and can be completed within a matter of weeks. Once designated, the qualifying body would need to consider the scope of the plan and may undertake informal consultation with the community through a questionnaire or local events. They will also need to collate information from various sources to compile an evidence base to help inform the first draft plan. If considering land, uh, allocating land for housing, they may also need to ask the community to suggest suitable sites in the area. 
This, this stage can take several months and in some cases over a year if specific surveys or reports need to be commissioned. Once the initial evidence gathering has, has been completed, the qualifying body can proceed to stage three and prepare a first draft plan, formulating policies with assistance from the local planning authority prior to publishing it for a formal six week consultation period. Responses to the consultation are then reviewed and any changes made, after which the final version of the plan is completed. This then moves to stage six, where the plan is submitted to the local planning authority, who then undertake the final statutory six week public consultation. Once that's complete, the local planning authority will then formally submit the neighbourhood plan for examination as stage seven. This is undertaken by an independent examiner who will review the plan, the supporting evidence and consultation responses received and determine whether the plan meets the legislative requirements. The examiner will then issue a, a report confirming the plan is either acceptable, can be made acceptable through modifications or should otherwise be withdrawn. If, it, if it's acceptable or once modifications have been made, it moves to stage eight, where a referendum is held locally to determine whether the plan should be formally made. Only local residents or those with a local connection can vote, and if the vote is more than 50% in support of the plan, it can proceed to adoption. The neighbourhood plan can then be formally made and is given the same legal status as the local plan, and all future planning applications in its area must then have full regard to its content. The overall timescales for preparing a neighbourhood plan can vary significantly, but normally uh, we would normally estimate that it takes between three to five years from start to finish. Next slide, please. So can, can neighbourhood plans allocate land for housing? Well, yes, they can, but um, there is a process to go through. The local authority must set a housing requirement for areas that are designated as neighbourhood plan areas in its local plan, or otherwise it must provide a figure when requested by the local neighbourhood plan group. Government actively encourage, encourage neighbourhood plans to allocate site, a site or sites to meet or exceed the housing requirement, but it is not a mandatory requirement. However, if a neighbourhood plan does not allocate land for housing, the local planning authority are likely to take on that task and allocate sites in the neighbourhood plan area within its own local plan. There are, however, benefits of the neighbourhood plan taking the task of allocating housing sites rather than leaving it to the local planning authority. These are firstly that a local community are likely to be the best place to, to identify the most appropriate sites as they will have a better understanding of local issues. Secondly, national legislation provides greater protection against speculative development in an area where the neighbourhood plan has allocated land for housing. Thirdly, there is greater scope to ensure that the type of new housing will meet, uh, help meet local identified needs. For instance, including a greater proportion of bungalows for the elderly to downsize or starter homes for younger people who cannot afford to live in the place they grew up in. Fourthly, there is greater scope to influence the design of new housing to better reflect local character, including specifying certain materials or architectural styles. And finally, it provides the ability to maximise the benefits of development for the wider community. This could include helping to meet local shortfall in, in children's play areas, for instance, or allotments, or otherwise to help secure funding for provisional or improvement to local facilities within the wider area. Next slide, please. So how, how, how to be effective during the neighbourhood plan process. From our experience over several years of working with neighbourhood plan groups and, and promoting clients' land for housing development, we have identified four key elements that should be adopted to maximise the effectiveness of engaging in the process. So firstly, engage early. Probably, this is probably the most critical element, as knowing when a neighbourhood plan is being prepared is, is essential, and engaging in the process as early as possible 
can be very beneficial. Your local authority website website will usually be best the best way to confirm if your local area has been designated as a neighbourhood plan area. However, following this initial stage, it can appear that nothing is happening, albeit the qualifying body may be busy behind the scenes preparing the evidence base to help inform the draft plan. For many, the first indication that a neighbourhood plan is being prepared is when that first draft plan is issued for public consultation, which can be too late to be able to have any meaningful input. Engaging early with the qualifying body also provides the opportunity to develop relationships and help reassure key decision makers that a site and associated proposals are professionally represented and there is a commitment to working alongside the local community to achieve common objectives. Secondly, be prepared. Even where a qualifying body is aware of your site and will therefore consider it alongside all potential options, the onus is very much on the landowner or its advisors to present the opportunity in its best light and ensure that any perceived constraints do not go against it. When presenting a site to a qualifying body, we will normally have commissioned a range of reports to assess key technical issues such as transport, drainage and ecology with a view to demonstrating that there are no reasons to discount the site from consideration. In addition, we will also prepare a concept master plan to show how the site could be developed, indicating the number of houses, the extent of public open space and associated landscaping. We will also try and identify any particular local issues which the site can help address. For instance, if there's a shortage of allotments in the area, some of the site could include additional provision. Providing a well-evidenced and presented opportunity will give the qualifying body confidence that were the site to be uh, selected for allocation, it is likely to be deliverable and secure the benefits identified. Thirdly, be flexible. Whilst we try and ensure we fully understand the local context and issues relevant to a specific area, a local community will have a wealth of knowledge of its, of its area. It is therefore important that any proposals that are presented are, pre are, are with a willingness to revise as necessary throughout the process to ensure that it aligns with local objectives or aspirations. Adopting a flexible approach and listening and reacting to, to feedback to, on your proposals is therefore critical, as again, the qualifying, qualifying body are likely to have greater confidence in your proposals if you are willing to do so. Finally, be patient. All areas of planning can be notoriously time consuming and neighbourhood plans are unfortunately no different. The scale of the task faced by a qualifying body in preparing a neighbourhood plan is significant and not something many will be familiar with. And so there are likely to be delays throughout the process as they work through the issues with limited skills and resources at their disposal. Understanding this and being patient is therefore essential. Nick will now talk through a couple of uh, our recent case studies which demonstrate how we have worked closely with qualifying bodies to successfully allocate uh, their our clients' land for housing. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. So I thought I would briefly talk through a couple of case studies of sites that we've successfully promoted three neighbourhood plans, one with some fairly conventional timings and the other slightly more unusual. I'll start with our site at Stratford Road, Honeybourne, located in Witchhaven, Worcestershire. This is a site the Roscon were originally introduced back in 2016 ultimately entering into a promotion agreement the following year. At that point in time, the site had no planning status and the local plan for Witchhaven had just been adopted and work on the neighbour plan was just getting started. One of the early pieces of work on the neighbour plan was the undertaking of a residence survey in 2017. Results of this were published early the following year and it became clear that there was a local housing needs requirement for the village. We therefore initiated contact with the steering group for the neighbourhood plan, explaining our interest in this particular site. At that stage, the group felt that it was too early to meet as they were wanting to undertake further community consultation first. Given this, we undertook various technical studies to support a vision document for the site, including a concept master plan. This was submitted to the steering group to demonstrate that the site was available, was being actively promoted and had no constraints preventing its development. Over the summer of 2018, the steering group held a consultation event to seek local input into the plan and presented several potential housing sites, as was one option, 
but was also a potential local green space. We therefore submitted further representation supporting the site as a housing allocation and setting out why a local green space designation would not comply with national policy. The outcome of this further consultation was that Roscon site was the preferred option for new housing for the local community. We were then able to meet with the steering group to talk through our concept plan and how it could be refined to better meet the, better meet the aspirations of the local community. We continued to work closely with the steering group, giving them confidence that the site was deliverable. And in March 2019, they published the pre-submission plan with our site identified as the sole housing allocation. Fantastic. But we did have some concerns, not least the proposed cap of 50 dwellings on the site and preventing the site coming forward until at least 2024. We explained our concerns to the steering group and formal comments were also made. The draft plan was submitted for, the, for examination in November 19, with these two elements of the policy retained. We therefore had to continue to raise issues with these policies through the formal examination of the plan. Unfortunately, the examiner agreed with our position that there was an immediate need for local housing in the community and that it would be contrary to national policy to be artificially restricting the capacity of a site. The plan proceeded to referendum in March 2020 and was made the following month. The making of the neighbourhood plan then enabled us to submit an application shortly thereafter in June of last year. Outline planning permission was ultimately achieved in December for up to 65 homes. The proposal included 40% affordable housing, 40% of the site was designated as public open space, and over half a million pounds of financial contributions were secured for improvements to local education, transport, sports and leisure facilities. The site was very shortly thereafter sold to Owl Homes, whose reserve matters planning application was lodged in March of this year. I'll now turn to our site at Desford in Hinckley and Bosworth, Leicestershire. We entered into a probation agreement in May 2018 on this site, and at the time, Desford neighbourhood plan was at an early stage, providing the opportunity for us to promote the site as a possible allocation. Simultaneously, given the age of the local authority's local plan, there was also the opportunity to promote the site through the emerging local plan. We therefore immediately started technical work to inform our vision for the site, sharing a vision document and master plan with both the steering group and borough council. We were able to meet with the borough council in July 2018 to talk this through, but the meeting with the steering group was delayed whilst they completed a site assessment report, analysing the merits of all possible development sites surrounding the village. That August, the steering group contacted us to let us know that of all the sites put forward, ours was deemed the most suitable to meet the village's future housing need. This led us to pursue a pre-application submission. Uh, so this led us um, for a pre-submission plan being published in November of 2018, with the site identified as an allocation for approximately 70 homes. In our discussions with the steering group, it became apparent that there was a significant pressure from speculative planning applications elsewhere in the village. And this is due to a lack of five year housing land supply in the borough as a whole. Given this and the favorable site assessment and the draft allocation, we were encouraged to come forward with an early application in advance of the neighborhood plan. An outline planning application was submitted in February, 2019 for up to 80 homes with full support of the steering group. This was ultimately approved for the Borough Council in October, with a sale completing to Miller Homes the following month. The site delivers 40% affordable housing, a range of house types to meet local need, and over £1 million in financial contributions for education, open space, play facilities, together with contributions for health and transport. Miller Homes have progressed really quickly on the site, and following a pretty swift reserve matters approval, work cited started on site and the development is nearing completion now with most homes sold already. The neighbourhood plan, which continued to identify our site for housing, was ultimately made in May of this year. What I think both of these case studies hopefully demonstrate is the importance of engagement with steering groups throughout the process. And at a relatively early stage, we were able to reassure both sets of local communities that these sites were not only the best options on paper for the village, but they were also deliverable. Also, in the Honeybourne example, we had to object to some fairly fundamental elements uh, of the allocation and through clear communication, this was done amicably and with no fallout. 
Lastly, in the case of Desford, we were more passive. Uh, if we were more passive in the neighbourhood plan process, the opportunity for the site to come forward significantly ahead of the neighbourhood plan programme could easily have been missed. And we may now just be starting work on the site, uh, on an application on the site, instead of having already sold at the site some 18 months prior. Uh, back to you, Daniel. Thanks, Nick. Uh, and um, thanks to uh, Dan as well. I think that uh, presentation was um, was very informative and uh, hopefully the audience has found it, uh, found it to be so. Um, Almost equally as exciting as the presentation, guys, is the results from the uh, from the first poll, um, and they are that 58.8% uh, of uh, respondents had uh, uh, yes had uh, heard of um, uh, or, or, or know what a neighbourhood plan is. 35.3% uh, uh, didn't, and five point uh, sorry, absolutely wrong. 58.8% had heard of it. And uh, they're only uh, they're only 5.9 uh, percent um, uh, that um, that hadn't. So uh, yeah, interesting. I don't know what you guys think of that. Whether we've got any thoughts? Uh, yeah, interesting to know. Hopefully, for the 5.9 percent, they do now, and also for the uh, 35 or so percent that uh, they know a little bit more about the process of neighbourhood plans and how they work. And hopefully the odd tip bit as well for uh, the remaining 58 or so percent. Yeah, absolutely. Ab absolutely, Nick. And uh, I think now would actually be an opportune time to release uh, the second poll question. Um, and that's, uh, does the audience think the local community through a neighbourhood plan is best placed to identify the most suitable and sustainable housing site or sites in their local area, or should this be left to the local planning authority? Um, four options, neighborhood plan, local planning authority, both, or don't know. So we'll uh, release the results of that uh, in, a, in a short while. Um, but now we're excited to uh, move on to some of the uh, questions that have been uh, asked by the uh, audience. And I know that um, uh, both uh, Dan and Nick have been, um, and uh, indeed myself, have been getting um, uh, excited about answering uh, some of these. Um, and I'm going to move on to a question from Brent. Uh, what's the best way, Brent, you ask, what's the best way to get involved in my uh, local uh, neighbourhood plan, and um, I think uh, Dan, you'd be uh, well placed to answer this one. Yeah, sure. Yeah, no problem. Um, yeah, I guess um, I guess the first thing to do is yeah, make sure that um, you're aware where they are in the process, and yeah, they will generally be ha holding um, meetings on a regular basis. So definitely, you should be attending those meetings and. I suppose ultimately you could volunteer. Um, as I said before, um, usually it's let, um, you know, a neighbourhood plan group is is led by the parish council, but it's separate from the parish council, and and it and it should be made up of a sort of a cross section of 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 the local community, and that means that residents should be welcomed on to that group. So you could become a, a volunteer and and ask to be on that uh, neighbourhood group. I think you just have to. To be very careful obviously if you are are there with the intention of trying to promote your land i think you know you could end up with a bit of a conflict there so i think um that might be might not be the best move but i think uh, making yourselves um familiar with the, the other members of the of the group and make you know, if you are promoting land uh, which is clearly what 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 the principal purpose of this presentation is about um is making clear that you make uh, the group aware that you you have land that may be suitable for housing and putting that forward as soon as possible um the other the other way of doing it is obviously getting professional representation either by using a planning consultant or or signing up with a, a land promoter like ourselves to do that on your behalf thanks for that uh thanks for that dan um and next question has come in uh, from uh, Samuel. Um, my village is currently preparing a neighbourhood plan, but my land has not been allocated 
what can I do? Um, and I think Dan, you could answer this one as well. Of course, yep, yeah. yep, yeah, no problem. I guess, I guess, um, yeah. Obviously, if, if a plan has got to the stage where it's allocating sites and it hasn't selected your site, I suppose you know the plan is at, at an advanced stage or at a stage where it can be difficult to try and turn that around. It's not impossible. Um, as I mentioned earlier in the process, there are two stage, there are two two draft stages of the plan. The first draft, which is the um, the pre-submission draft, and then the second draft is the submission draft. So it depends at what stage it is. If it's at the the latter stage, the submission draft stage, it may be too late to try and turn that around. I suppose you have to be, um, I suppose the question is, were they aware of your site? Did they consider it? Um, and they, because they need to demonstrate that they have considered all, all uh, potential options and, and explain why they've selected the site they have in the plan. Um, so I guess you, you need to look at that site and how does it compare with yours? Is it a better site? You know, you need, you need to obviously look at it from an objective point of view, but if you don't agree that they've selected the right site, then obviously through the consultation, you have the ability to make representations and, and highlight why you don't think that's that's the right right choice to make uh, for, for for reasons that you, that you need to put together. So I think, or, or you get some assistance from um, someone like a planning consultant or a promoter to do that for you. Um, so hopefully that, that answers the question. Thanks, uh, thanks, Dan. And we've, and we've got we've got one in from uh, Gary here. Uh, how can I find out if my local village is um, preparing a neighbourhood development plan? Uh, Nick, would you like to answer that one? Yeah, gladly. Um, yeah, so this should be available both on your parish and local plan websites. Uh, often these websites can be a bit tricky to navigate, so I'll find a Google search of the local authority and the words neighbourhood plan or the place name and the words neighbourhood plan should set you off in the right direction. Uh, local authorities are required to publish a record of the status of all neighbourhood plans in their areas and the stage that they've reached. So not only should this tell you if there is a plan, that's in the offing, but also where it's got to. Um, back to you, Dan. I think we've now got the poll results in for the second question. We have, we have, Nick. Uh, we absolutely have. Yeah. Would you like to? Would you like to give those out? Yep. Please too. So the answers were um, neighbourhood plan, thirty-two percent. Local authority, sixteen percent. Both forty-eight percent, and don't know four percent. Interesting. Dan, any any thoughts on that at all? Yeah, I guess um, it's. I, I think that always the key thing with 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 housing allocations is it can be very um, divisive locally, I guess, and emotive. Um, and you could say, from one perspective, it would be better for the local planning authority to do that job because it it takes out. The local politics of it i mean there's, there's politics involved in every level of planning but um when you get down to a village level um there have been occasions that i'm aware of uh, probably early on when neighborhood plans were introduced where you know it sort of set one side of the village up against the other because they've selected a site on one side of the village and obviously that side of the village is not happy with it and wanted it to go somewhere else so it can it can be quite emotive um so from one one perspective i suppose if, if the local planning authority did it, then it, take, it takes it out of the uh, local people's hands. But I suppose the opposite side of the coin is local people probably know best about where where the local where housing should go in their village and, and their best place to do that. So I sort of lean towards probably um, neighbourhood plans are a good way forward for doing for, for allocating sites in, in an area. I'd probably side would go down that route, provided everyone stays calm and you know ultimately it's you've got to pick the best site and and hopefully have the evidence to back that up. Sure, sure. Yeah. Thanks Dan. Now not not our Nick, but another Nick, uh you've asked, I think my land might be suitable for housing. Uh so what's the best way of promoting it? Um and seeing as it's asked by Nick, why don't we have it answered by Nick? Nick, over to you. Thank you. Um, 
Yes, uh, I think it's really important to make sure that the council are aware that the land is available for development. So in the first instance, the local authority, um, depending on the stage at which the local authority has reached with any new plan, submitting the site may coincide with a formal call for sites. Um, a good tip is that if work is underway on a new local plan, you should be able to register for updates on the local plan process so that you don't miss any formal call for sites that the council is undertaking. These will be used to prepare a strategic housing land availability assessment, which will then form part of the evidence base for the local authority's plan, but also should form the starting point for any neighbourhood plans when they look for development sites that might be available. Um, if you're aware that a neighbourhood plan is being produced, though, I would definitely reach out to the steering groups for neighbourhood plans, much like in the Desford and Honeybourne examples that I talked about area, uh, earlier, uh, so that they are aware that your site is available for development um i've seen uh, sort of yeah moving on from that hopefully that's helpful i've seen yeah quite a number of interesting questions coming up uh, as we've been speaking which is great um got a couple here that i'll fire in dan's direction and yeah so the first one was from vivian uh, which was it's Potentially, uh, yeah, a slightly tricky one for you, Dan, sorry, but uh, won't neighbourhood plans be overruled when the new planning law comes in, giving more authority to local and area at local and area authorities? And yeah, one for you, Dan H. OK, I, I think this might be referring to um, uh, the fact that the government are looking or the central government are looking to overhaul, completely overhaul their local plan yes. system. Yeah, that was my um, and but there, there will still be a place for neighborhood plans and, and i don't think that will necessarily change much in relation to how neighborhood plans proceed going forward um i, I haven't seen anything in in the white paper or, or elsewhere to suggest that neighborhood plans are are going to be um uh, withdrawn uh, in any way and i think um everything points the opposite direction they are another way of bringing forward housing we are in a housing crisis um, and there's a there's an unmet need for housing across the country so this is just another way of delivering or bringing forward sites for for housing across the country so I'd, i i don't necessarily think it will change i think there are big changes ahead um we don't know exactly what they mean no um what they will will include um and how local plans will change um there was a uh, an announcement this, that was published this morning um a um that was looking at how the new system might work but yeah it's still very early days so it's difficult to say how that will impact but i'm i'm pretty sure neighbor plans are here to stay and will will continue in pretty much in the same way uh, as they are today perfect thank you dan and then another one from laura which was uh, do i need to be an active member of the parish or town council to start thinking about putting together a neighborhood plan um yeah i'm just I'm, I'm not sure i guess what she's asking is um sorry just um do you, yeah i mean i as i said before the qualifying body is usually set up by the parish council um they will be looking for volunteers from residents to to help them with that task um so i guess um yeah it would help if you are vol you volunteer if you're not already a, a parish or town councillor to volunteer and get yourself on the on that steering group so that you have an input in that so that's that's obviously the best way of getting involved in in the preparation of the neighborhood plan yeah, as i said absolutely. before yeah if you're if you're actually promoting a site um it may be difficult to sort of wear those two hats because i think you'd, you'd end up having a potential conflict and would need to withdraw from the group so i think um yeah if you're if you're solely looking at being uh, being interested in helping prepare the neighbourhood plan that that is yeah put yourself forward and volunteer thanks dan uh andy you've asked uh, i'm not aware that my village is intending to prepare a neighbourhood plan what's the best way to encourage the parish council to prepare one um and i think i'll answer this one for you andy um i would suggest uh, in the first instance you you contact the parish council uh, to ask the question of whether the site um, uh, has been um, uh, wh wh whether whether sites have been um, uh, considered and are the parish council looking to prepare um, uh, a neighborhood plan 
um, to encourage them, perhaps look, have uh, neighboring uh, parishes prepared um, a neighborhood plan and been through the process. Could some of the steering group from um, uh, from those neighboring parishes come and talk to uh, the steering group and the and the uh, uh, parish council uh, within uh, your community? Um, and uh, it's always it's always good uh, when trying to uh, motivate. Uh, 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 the parish council and indeed a, a, a steering group when it's when it's formed um, to have a um, uh, a key objective uh, something that needs improving within the village within the community that might be place space provisions it might be um, uh, new changing rooms or additions to a, a sports hall if there's one there um, improvements really to local infrastructure um, that could um, uh, could be planned out via the uh, neighbourhood plan. Um, and to help with this, it's very important to note that uh, if SIL is in operation within that local authority, the financial um, uh, reward um, uh, benefit uh, that would go back to the parish to spend on those improvements would increase from 15% up to 25%. So, so we've got, we've got, we've got, you know, um, uh, you know, we're moving from 15 to 25 of all those financial receipts coming into that parish council to help fund that local objective, uh, like the aspirations that I was referring to to earlier. Um, so, yeah, it, it, I, I, I really engage with engage with the parish, um, look for other um, uh, neighbouring parishes that have been through the been through the process um, and, um, and, and and try and find that local good news story that the community can get behind, uh, the wishes and wants, uh, and, and put those aspirations forward. I don't know if I've missed anything there, guys. No, I think I think that's that's right, Dan. I suppose the other one is um, is is maybe speaking to the local planning authority as well, because there will be a um, an officer that's responsible for neighbourhood plans yeah. at at the local planning authority level, um, and maybe invite to get them get them to come out and do a presentation to the parish council to show them, you know, what's involved and what the benefits are as well. So you, you're getting as many people coming in saying what a good idea it could be. Sure. Yeah. No. Thanks, Dan. Um, so so hopefully, Andy, that's um that's that's answered your question. Um, Sarah, you're asking. How long does a neighbourhood plan take to prepare? Um, Nick, would you like to um, answer this one? Yeah, gladly. Um, <laughs> probably a visual uh, aid of a piece of string for that one uh, yeah. would assist. The I think Dan touched on it in his presentation. I, yeah, they really do vary hugely. Um, big factor is the resource available to the uh, to that parish council or steering group, uh, the expertise that they've got, uh, and also the time available to them, uh, and also the complexities of that particular neighbourhood plan and any particular issues, you know, what's the quantum of development that's being allocated, are there particular sensitivities such as listed buildings or scheduled monuments that make things a bit more complicated than they might otherwise be. Um, but I think a, you know, a good rule of thumb is about three to five years. Uh, I am aware of those that take considerably longer. One that springs to mind um, is one that's, I think, sort of six years and counting, and they're yet to publish a draft. But I think, as I say, three to five years is a good rule of thumb uh, estimate or as to how long they would typically take. I'm conscious there yeah, that we've got quite a lot of uh, yeah questions coming in. Um, another one I saw earlier. Um, was uh let me just find it i don't think it was strictly on neighborhood plans uh but it's an interesting question nonetheless and i'll fire it to dan hatcher again our planning guru uh which was this is from mark can you please address the scenario of rural exception for affordable homes yeah sure nick um yeah this is this is sort of separate from um neighborhood plans it's usually uh so rural exception Rural exception schemes are are basically um, schemes for housing the on sites that wouldn't normally get planning permission. Um, and usually there will be a, a policy, a specific policy on this within a local plan. And they do vary from council to council. Um, but generally, 
what what it will say is they will allow um, small scale um, uh, housing schemes on the edge of existing uh, settlements, villages or towns uh, where they are solely for or 100 percent affordable housing or predominantly affordable housing to meet a, an identified need. So if there's an area with, that has done a recent housing needs survey, they've identified that there is a need for, say, 10 affordable houses within that particular village then that provides the evidence base then to, to submit an application, um, either that's community-led or it's led by the landowner or a rural, um, a rural housing provider. They will bring that site forward um, on the basis that there is an identified need that isn't being met in any other way and hence why it's called an exception site, a rural exception site. So hopefully that, that clarifies things. Yeah, thanks. Um, thanks, Dan. Uh, Debbie, you're asking how does a neighbourhood plan group decide which site or sites to to allocate? Um, and um, if it's okay, Debbie, I'll um, I'll take this one. Um, f first port of call would be looking at the um, uh, SHLA, which is the Strategic Housing Land Availability Assessment. Um, we work in an, in an industry of acronyms, so for anyone not familiar with SHLARS, that that's uh, that's what it is, and that well, that would be the principal source of uh, evidence. Um, then the uh, neighbourhood plan group should also provide an opportunity for sites that have not been put forward uh, in the SHLA uh, to be put forward at the appropriate uh, time uh, to the. Um, uh, to the, the neighbourhood plan process uh, and the neighbourhood plan group should undertake their own assessment of sites also to determine the most appropriate sites and provide justification for their choices, why have they selected certain sites over, over others. Uh, preferred sites should then be consulted on as part of the wider draft plan. Um, landowners should be encouraged to uh, submit their site to the neighbourhood planning group when they're made aware that the neighbourhood plan is under preparation. I think what I would suggest uh, is that even if it hasn't been brought to your attention to put the site forward and you're aware a neighbourhood plan is taking place, is to put your site uh, forward. Um, you, you don't want to be late in the process you're better uh, to come forward as soon as you can and make sure you get um, a, a notification back from the working group that they have received your site and they're aware that you do want it to be considered. Uh, you want to make sure that you're not uh, left out of the uh, invites to the party. Um, uh, so that, 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 that really is, is, is how a neighbourhood plan group should decide and make their choices on which site or sites to allocate, in my opinion. Um, Dan, Nick, have I missed anything there? I no? thought that was comprehensive. Yep. <laughs> Thanks. There you go. <laughs> Full marks. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Um, Luke, uh, you've asked, the local plan for my area has already allocated land for housing in my village. So is it likely that neighbourhood plan will also allocate land for uh, additional housing. Okay. Uh, Dan, you happy yep. with that one? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, um, yeah. You'd think that if a if a local plan has allocated a site in a village, then there wouldn't be any justification for a neighbourhood plan to, to also do the same. And, and I suppose, in many ways, a local um, a neighbourhood plan would probably consider it unnecessary if, if the local plan has already done the job but I suppose it, every, every case is different and I suppose you have to understand the specific circumstances we will look at um, in the first instance we'll look at how old is the local plan you know is it is it 10 years old and it allocated that site you know um, back in you know 2010 and it's been built out and since then you've got you've got new needs that have arisen during that period so that, you know it, it does vary I think um, it is, and it is possible um, there are cases where, yeah, there sites are being allocated both within a local plan and a neighbourhood plan. I think, as, as I said earlier in the presentation, um, government actively encourage uh, neighbourhood plans 
to meet or exceed the housing requirement uh, for their for their local area and you know that's that's all to do with the, the housing crisis that we're in and trying to to maximize the delivery of sites across the, across the country um so i think the other the other element to it might be even if a local plan has allocated a site it might not be addressing uh, specific needs within the village so it, it may well be a site's come forward for 100 houses and there's you know 40 percent of that's affordable but there's a more recent housing needs survey saying the um the need for affordable housing is much greater than that and that allocation won't ad fully address that need and hence you need an additional site whether that's wholly affordable or a large proportion of it is affordable just to meet that identified need in that local area then that that could justify an additional allocation so i think there are there are circumstances where it where it can happen there may be circumstances where a neighborhood plan will not want to allocate a site because they they consider that that need has already been met through the local plan so you know you have to look at the evidence and try and see whether there is a case to to justify it in a particular circumstance thanks dan um nicola you have asked uh my local village has made a neighborhood plan already so is it too late to promote my land um it, 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 in 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 many ways yes in in the in in the short term um however there may be an opportunity to promote the site uh through a neighborhood plan uh, uh review um uh, these um are uh, not required though to be reviewed every five years like local plans are so if you've if you've missed the uh, neighborhood plan yeah because perhaps you were uh, too late putting your land forward um, uh, as I was alluding to earlier with with, with one of my answers um, then you, you could try the local plan promotion uh, process because the, 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 there is a, a requirement for those to be reviewed every five years the neighborhood plan in in theory will get reviewed at a point in time but there's no specified time scales uh for that uh so it really does come down to getting in early as the um as the guys were saying during their presentation you know preparing your evidence base giving your site the best possible chance uh d just d don't leave it late and and you know keep on reminding the working group that you want you'd like your site considered uh, and make sure that, that they're fully aware of that um would you would you both can concur with that as in dan and nick yep. as yes. to <laughs> yeah yeah no, that's yeah. absolutely right it's absolutely right yeah it's yeah once once the plan is made it's yep. yeah it it's unlikely that you'll have a chance in the immediate future as you say you then turn to the local plan, I guess, and and see whether there's a, a more immediate opportunity there to to do it through that process. And then, similarly, again, the neighbourhood plan at, at some point in time will need to be updated because if anything becomes out of date. It's a, it's a it's you know it's a snapshot in time and needs to be kept up to date as much as possible. Sure. No. Thanks, Dan. Um, Nick, are there any other questions that the yes. Uh, yeah i think we've still got uh just enough enough time to hope to get one more in uh so yeah. interesting one from olivia uh which was if the parish council are reluctant to put a plan together because they don't want development how can you convince them that it's better than leaving it up to the local authority uh, dan dan h one last time yeah sure yeah no it's a good question um i yeah i think we find us, ourselves in this in this sometimes because i think there are there is a reluctance either to initiate a neighbourhood plan or or actually if they do to actually allocate a site for housing and so i think i sort of go back to my my slide earlier about the benefits of of, of neighbourhood planning and the benefits of allocating a site because it does it does give the the village protection against speculative development elsewhere and i think that is that's probably the the major benefit um and you and you're in you're in control of your own destiny um because yeah if 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 you leave it to a local authority it doesn't mean that they're going to pick the side that everyone in the village thinks is the most suitable they could go for something completely different um 
and it's really out of your control to a large degree you are you are consulted on it as a parish or as a resident but you know very much it's the local authority they're in the driving seat and they decide ultimately which sites they want to pick um if you take on that um take on that um decision through the neighborhood plan then you are in control of your own destiny and you direct development that's the whole point of neighborhood planning is it's it's down to you as a local community to decide where you want to put development and if you do that then you are protected against speculative development on other sites around the village because you have you have a plan that's up to date has identified a site and if someone comes forward to say well i'm going to put housing on another site you can say, well, no, you've got to, you've got to, you've got to respect the, our neighbour plan, and this is where we're going to put our housing. So you put yourself in a very strong position then. So that is that is one of the benefits. There are other benefits which I've listed. So um, I think it's it's focusing on the benefits. Yeah. Thanks, Dan. Um, any more, Nick? There, quick, quick ones just before I. I think uh, that was the, the last one that jumped out. So yeah, okay. back, back to you. No, just to add, um, yeah. expand on that from Dan. I, yeah, it probably, um, I think we touched on it earlier as well, but SIL as well would be another benefit. Um, if there is SIL in place, uh, in one of your answers, you touched on that sort of from the 15% yeah. to the 25%. That's a huge uh, financial uplift potentially to a local authority, uh, to a local community. Uh, so that is a you know, big tangible benefit. That's yeah. community infrastructure levy. Just sorry, <laughs> it's another acronym. But, but yeah, that's yeah. basically any new development in an area um, where that where there is a community infrastructure levy. There is a it's basically like a roof tax where a developer will pay um, money to the council, and then that gets redistributed to to basically fund infrastructure to support that development. And as 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 Dan said earlier, if you've got a made neighbourhood plan in place, you get a lot. You get a bigger share of that you get 25 percent a quarter of all the all the money that is is given to the local authority as part of any development goes to the parish council to spend on their own projects within the local area so again it is a fine financial incentive there as well thanks dan and and and, and thanks nick for uh, for all those comprehensive um answers to the questions and, and hopefully um the the audience and those who have asked the questions have, have found them to be so as well um I think this is bringing us towards the the end of um, uh, this uh, webinar that uh, we hope you as uh, an audience have found uh, to be um, useful and informative. And, and I would just remind you um, uh, again in relation to the neighborhood plan booklet that's been prepared uh, by um, uh, the team um under the uh, direction of uh, dan um that booklet available within the resources hub so so please do uh, uh view that we think you'll find that um uh, useful in addition to well, ho hopefully you'll find it useful in addition to what you've uh, been listening to uh this afternoon uh, hopefully we've answered uh, as many questions as have um, as, as possible if there are any we haven't answered don't worry we will uh, respond to you uh, separately um, we'd like to um, thank uh, farmers weekly for helping us put this uh, webinar on uh, I would like to thank Dan and Nick for uh, frankly doing all the work and, uh, and preparation on, on this entire webinar um uh, and allowing me just to uh come in here and there um and uh we very much look forward to uh our next um uh, uh webinar and welcoming you uh to that um and uh that is all from roscon strategic land today if you do have land that um you think uh may be right to be putting forward to the neighborhood plan um, uh, working group and your uh, your village is going to be preparing one um, uh, you'll see from our experience that we are um, uh, we have good experience uh, within within this uh, within this part of planning essentially um, and we would be delighted to assist you and help you to um, maximize your return on your land uh, ensuring that you're not late to the party that you're nice and early, that you're well prepared, that all of your reports and studies that we would obviously be paying for um, are um, uh, put forward. 
um, in a nice comprehensive format for the working group to uh, review uh, and hopefully consider your site favorably. So if you do have any land parcels that you think would be right to be put forward to uh, the neighborhood plan uh, process and the steering group, please do not hesitate to get in touch. We will be delighted to give you an absolutely free of charge appraisal. Um, and um, Dan, Nick, unless there's anything else from you guys, I think we'll be saying goodbye. Yeah, not for me. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for viewing. Thanks very much.